Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Spears, and I'm a partner in Allen & Overy in the Public International Law and Dispute Resolution Practice. I also co-head the Business and Human Rights Practice at Allen & Overy. I want to welcome you all here today. Um, on behalf of Brick Court Chambers, which has very kindly um, asked me to chair today's session. Um, and this is part of Brick Court Chambers' Public Law and Human Rights Seminar Series. And the title of today's uh, particular seminar is The Increase of Litigation and Regulation About Business Responsibility for Human Rights and Environmental Impacts. Um, and the speakers today, and in particular Paul Bowen QC, who will begin um, the talk today, will consider the general move to bring corporate issues into public law areas, which will mean, of course, constitutional law, administrative law, tax law, and criminal law, among others, although Paul will elaborate on that. Now, the public international lawyers among us, and you have a number of them um, participating today as panelists, um, have for many years now been hearing about the move of corporate issues into the public international law um, area. Um, and those efforts have, um, as you will all know, had limited success, though we do have um, a, an important document, which I'm sure each of our speakers will talk about at some point, which is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. But there's been much discussion as to whether bringing corporate issues into international law constitutes some form of doctrinal overreach, and it is therefore with great pleasure that we move the conversation now to look at public international, or public law, I should say, on the domestic plane. And I think a lot of us will be very interested to hear how this, um, these issues are now moving into the domestic plane. So without further ado, I want to introduce um, our speakers today. First up, we have Paul Bowen QC, and Paul is a barrister with Brick Court Chambers. He's a judicial review expert and is recommended as a leading silk across the full spectrum of public, public and administrative law. And his work often involves human rights issues um, as well as EU and other international law elements. Now we also have Tim Johnston, also part of Brick Court Chambers and his practice spans public law, public international law and EU competition law as well. And Tim is recognized as a leading junior in all of the areas of his work. And we'll have the great opportunity to hear of some of the cases um, that Tim has worked on together as well with Professor Robert McCorkdale, who is also presenting, um, including in the well-known to this um, audience uh, case of Vedanta versus Lungo. Now, Professor Robert McCorkdale will also participate. And, and as you know, he is also a member of Brick Court Chambers. And Robert practices in public international law including all areas of human rights um, law, and he's been an advocate before both the Supreme Court and the International Court of Justice. And then finally, last but not least, we have Ray Lindsay, who's a partner in the litigation and dispute resolution practice at Clifford Chance, and she's also co-head of the firm's public international law and business and human rights practices. And Ray is a member of the firm's ESG board as well. And Ray advises clients across all sectors um, on a broad range of human rights related matters. Um, and so thank you for everyone for attending today. The one point of housekeeping I will make is that if um, participants or audience members rather could please email any questions for participants um, by way of there is a um, question uh, box on the dashboard that you should have up on your screen. And if I understand correctly, if you post a question there, um, it will then come through to me and I will try to present them to the panelists. Um, so Paul, if you could please kick us off. Well, thank you for that introduction, Suzanne. Um, so I'm going to try and answer this question in the eight minutes allocated to me. When does a private entity owe public law duties. I better explain first what I mean by public law. It's the law that governs the relationship between private individuals and public bodies, including states, and the relationship between different public bodies, including different states. It includes public international law, EU law, constitutional and administrative law, and human rights law. It also includes criminal and other regulatory law by which the state places statutory duties on private and public bodies alike. But I'm particularly concerned with public law principles as they have developed to regulate and restrain abuses of government power and how these may apply to private bodies. 
uh, by public law, I'm contrasting it with private law, which governs the relationships between individuals, primarily through the law of contracts, trusts, and torts. Now, the original source of public power was the monarch, and public law in the United Kingdom developed to put limits on that power. The right of parliament, not the king, to make laws, and the principle that the law applies to everyone, including the king, the rule of law, are foundational public law principles. Public law includes the rules and remedies developed by the courts to ensure public bodies act not only in accordance with the powers conferred upon them, the ultra-virus principle, but also that they act in the public interest and according to certain standards. They must exercise their powers rationally and fairly and in accordance with individual rights. Those standards of public conduct have since been joined by other standards derived from EU and human rights law, including the test of proportionality and the prerogative remedies of quashing orders, mandatory orders and prohibitory orders have been joined by the more modern remedies of injunctions and damages, at least where breaches of human rights are concerned. So if public law governs the exercise of power by public bodies, how can public law duties be owed by private entities? This is a question Mr Justice Singh posed recently in Pachural, uh, a case that the reference will come up with a slide in a moment. He said the fundamental basis of public law is that public authorities have only those powers which are conferred upon them by law and must act in the public interest. Private actors such as employers and business entities more generally do not necessarily have the same duties. So private bodies are free to act in their own self-interest or the interest of their shareholders. And it's generally no business of the courts to police a contract entered into by consenting parties in a free market to ensure one party acts rationally or fairly. Now, of course, private bodies can be given statutory powers and may then become subject to principles of public law. But what if they're not exercising statutory powers themselves, but have contracted with a public body to discharge their statutory powers? Or if they exercise significant power, including monopolistic power that substantially affects individual rights? Or if they've entered into a contract with another party who is at a considerable disadvantage and has made a bad deal, or the contract is silent? Or if the exercise of contractual rights will have significant negative impacts upon third parties who are not parties to the contract? Now, of course, one of the primary functions of government is to regulate private actors and to prevent them from abusing their power, whether it's employment, to data protection law, financial services, to consumer law, human trafficking, to human rights laws. But sometimes a treaty or statute is silent, or the act in question takes place outside the jurisdiction, or the duty in question does not apply to private bodies. And it's in this context that public law, including human rights law, may reach beyond or supplement statutory regulation. Now, in the time I have, I can only summarise the ways in which it may do so. But some of these developments have incurred on the international plane through instruments such as the UN Human Rights Framework for Business and Human Rights, uh, the RUGI principles, which have in turn informed developments in uh, tort law. And Tim and Robert are going to speak to these. Domestically, in limited circumstances, a private company may be subject to judicial review because they exercise public functions usually because a statutory function has been conferred upon them. Thus, a private corporation may owe duties under the Human Rights Act if they exercise functions of a public nature, although this provision has been interpreted restrictively, as the YL and Birmingham case demonstrates. Again, uh, that will be on the slide. Similarly, in orthodox judicial review claims, the courts will apply public law principles to a private entity if there is a sufficient public law element involved in the decision. But the circumstances in which they do so are rare, even if the nature of the power being exercised is one that is susceptible to, judi to judicial review if carried out by a public body. So, for example, in the Lib Liberal Democrats and ITV case uh, last year, a decision by ITV to hold an election debate that exclude the Liberal Democrats was held not to be amenable to judicial review, despite the exceptional public interest in the issue and the fact that, had it been the BBC, the decision would have been amenable. 
Now, there is a strong argument that public law principles and remedies were once more widely available in private relationships than they are now. Professor Dawn Oliver has written that in certain circumstances, private bodies exercising private functions owe duties of fairness and rationality in private law to those affected by their acts or decisions, independently of contract or trusts. In other words, that the common law itself imposes such duties. These principles she derives from a series of cases uh, involving exclusion from trade associations or professional bodies, including the Nagel and Fielden case and McInnes and Onslow Fane. As she writes, there may be significant concentrations of power in private as well as public hands. And as a matter of public policy, the law should prevent abuses of such power to the detriment of individuals or the public interest. Now, Professor Oliver argues that these principles became divorced from the development of public law generally as a result of the procedural reforms that led to the development of judicial review, notably Section 31 of the Senior Courts Act 1981 and Order 53 of the old Rules of Supreme Court. And these shifted the focus away from the nature of the power being exercised to the nature of the body exercising it. And as a result, the procedure whereby public law remedies may be obtained applying public law principles is now extremely limited in its application to private bodies. But public law, including human rights law principles, are showing a resurgence in private law proceedings, both in tort, as Tim and Robert will discuss, and in contract. So in the Braganza and BP Shipping Limited case, uh, the Supreme Court held that a private company's investigation into the death of one of its employees was in breach of an implied term because it had failed to take into account relevant factors and was therefore irrational, applying the familiar Wensbury test. And Mrs. Berganza, who was not a party to the contract, uh, as an interested third party, was entitled to enforce the implied term of the contract against the company. In the Heather and Leonard case back in 2002, Lord Wolf held that where a public authority contracts out its public functions to a private body, although that private body does not then become a public authority under the Human Rights Act, a duty to comply with human rights may be imposed by contract, which might be enforceable even by third parties. And in the Cavendish Square Holding case, uh, the Supreme Court considered that a contractual provision was penal and therefore unenforceable if it was disproportionate to any legitimate interest of the innocent party in the enforcement of the primary obligation under the contract. Now, Mr. Justice Singh, in the Pacherol case that I mentioned, described these and other cases as another illustration, if one were needed, of the continuing strength of the common law, in particular, its ability to develop in an incremental way so as to meet the needs of a modern society. And as private entities discharge more and more government functions and acquire greater power over individuals' lives, uh, we can expect further developments of this kind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Tim, if we could hear from you now, please. Thank you. So I'm going to be speaking uh, during my time about the place of human rights and human rights law standards in recent decisions concerning parent company liability. And I want to start with a question. If a UK-based parent company owns a subsidiary, and that subsidiary causes serious environmental damage in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, by way of toxic pollution, is that UK parent company at least potentially liable for the acts of its subsidiary? And that's the question that's troubled the Supreme Court twice uh, in the last two years. And what I want to do is to talk about the place of human rights and international human rights law standards in informing the answer to that question. And I want to do that by reference to the two cases that you can see uh, on the slide there. I was instructed together with Robert to uh, intervene uh, in those cases on behalf of the International Commission of Jurists and a corporate responsibility coalition. Um, as you can see, the cases of Vedanta uh, and Okpabi and judgment is still awaited uh, in Okpabi. So Vedanta, the, the very basic facts uh, were that this was a claim by 1,800 Zambian citizens who lived near the Concola copper mine. Uh, and the claim was a claim for personal injury 
uh, and for property damage arising out of toxic discharges into the watercourses. Uh, Vedanta, the parent company, was housed in the UK uh, and the claimants sued them here in reliance on Brussels recast. Uh, and they also sought permission from the court to serve the claim out on the Concola copper mine as a necessary and proper party. And the case turned on whether the claimants had an arguable claim against Vedanta, the, the anchor defendant, uh, because if they did, then they would get permission to serve out. And the answer to that question turned on whether or not Vedanta, the parent company, owed the claimants a duty of care. If I could have the next slide, please, that'd be great. And I set out on that slide Vedanta's two core submissions as captured by the court. The first of which was, in essence, this is nothing to do with us. We're merely uh, the indirect owner of a subsidiary overseas. We have zero visibility of this and no more than that. And the second submission was, were you to impose liability on us, that would be a novel, a controversial extension of the law of tort. Uh, as you can see from the final quote, the court didn't agree. Uh, and indeed, the court said that there's nothing novel about the suggestion that company A may owe a duty of care to person C arising out of the conduct of company B. And it pointed back to a whole established line of case law, in particular Chandler and Cape, for that proposition. Uh, and the court's reasoning, or the reason the court found in this case that Vedanta, at least potentially, to meet the threshold for service out, owed a liability or a duty of care to, to the claimants was because of what Vedanta itself had said on the subject. Because what the court said is that liability can be established in cases of this kind where the parent company has assumed responsibility for the conduct of its subsidiary. And so the court very simply said, well, let's see what Vedanta has to say about that question. Now, Vedanta had published a number of prospectuses and annual reports, and those documents expressly held themselves out as having taken on that responsibility. They referred to their global governance and environmental and human rights standards and the responsibility they took and the care they took for the conduct of their subsidiaries. So in very simple terms, Vedanta had announced to the world that it took responsibility for the conduct of its subsidiaries and the Supreme Court said, well, in that case, we'll hold you to that standard. Now, as I said earlier, Robert McCorkadale and I, various other people, were instructed to intervene in that case and to urge the court to conclude that the answer to that question, is there a duty of care, is informed by established international human rights standards. And if we could go to the next slide there, I've sketched out in very brief terms what some of those are, and there's no time really to do more than just touch on these, but, but the best known of them uh, of course, the United Nations Guiding Principles, um, which the UK has, has signed up to. Uh, the OECD guidelines uh, are, are similar. Each of these sets of guidelines are similar but different in certain respects, but the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises were particularly important in these cases. And then there are the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. Um, now, there's an awful lot that could be said about these, and there isn't time to unpack them in any detail. But if we could have the next slide, the three points that I want to really draw out of them are that are the three kind of cardinals that they set out by way of guidelines are firstly due diligence. Companies need to be aware of the consequences of their practices and of their business. Secondly, mitigation. They need to take steps where they can to prevent and to mitigate risk and to avoid damage. And thirdly, remediation. So where there's been loss suffered, they need to provide some kind of remedy. But the critical point I want to cause, pause on for a moment now is the point at the top of the slide, which is that each of the various guidelines in different ways is clear that they apply at the level of the undertaking or the enterprise or the corporate group or structure more widely. And the UNGPs are perhaps clearest about this. They say that they apply regardless of structure. So these obligations are not confined to individual corporations or companies or entities, but they apply across and through the corporate group. But what relevance does this have to domestic law? If I can have the next slide, please. Two, two things to point to here. The first is a document published by the UK government, Good Business, implementing the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. 
Now, it's clear immediately from that that this document derives from the UNGPs. It's, it's about the implementation and the effectiveness of those in UK law. And what they say, in effect, is this is what the UK government considers to be the standard against which UK companies should behave. And the answer to that is, in crude terms, by reference to the UNGPs. So that's the first point. And the second uh, is the Companies Act 2006, as amended in 2013. And those 2013 amendments introduced certain obligations for certain kinds of companies, not all, uh, produce what are called strategic reports. And those strategic reports have to include consideration of questions like environmental matters, including the impact of the business on the environment, and social community and human rights issues. And it's worth saying that Good Business, the document at the top of the slide, says in terms that this 2013 amendment was introduced into the Companies Act in order to bring some elements of these UNGPs into domestic statute law. Okay, three points uh, for conclusion, if I could go to the next slide. So three questions in essence. Did the court in Vedanta have expressed regard to these standards? Here's the answer was, uh, sadly, no. The Supreme Court didn't refer to these standards when deciding whether Vedanta arguably owed a duty of care to the claimants. Uh, they anchored the analysis very clearly to the individual facts of the case. Now we live in hope that they'll take a different view, of course, in Octavi. The second question, does that mean that these international guidelines were irrelevant? Do they have no place in the analysis and the facts and the outcome of that case? And my answer is that, in fact, they were relevant to what happened in Vedanta, because most importantly, they shaped the conduct of Vedanta itself. Why was Vedanta producing these leaflets, publicizing its outstanding environmental and human rights standards? Precisely because they are aware of and conscious of these international standards. And indeed, Vedanta and Shell as well, for the purposes of Octavi, have said in terms that they subscribe to these international guidelines. The standard that they held themselves to was the standard set out in the guidelines. And of course, furthermore, that via the nexus of the Companies Act, a hard-edged obligation of that kind. And it's my suggestion that we're moving in only one direction in terms of those hard-edged obligations. They're here, they're here to stay, and they're only going to grow. Finally, what's the proper corporate response? Because the temptation, of course, in the light of the Vedanta judgment is to withdraw from this kind of obligation, to argue that you've not assumed responsibility for your subsidiary and indeed to trumpet that fact, say we have no understanding of what our subsidiaries do, we take no responsibility for their conduct, we have no idea whether they're causing environmental damage or what their human rights conduct is. Don't scrutinise us, we simply don't know. It's my firm conviction that that would be very bad commercial advice to give to a client. Uh, and maybe we can talk about this further at the end, but it, it's, in my view, it's going to harm investment. Investors are savvy about this kind of thing. That's precisely why these companies produce these prospectuses, touting their, their concern in this area. They repel customers who are increasingly savvy about these kinds of things as well. So conducting due diligence, mitigating risk and remediation are here to stay. They're the kinds of obligations that cannot, and I would also suggest should not, uh, be avoided uh, in the modern world. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to pass over now to Robert. Thank you very much, Tim. I was not wanting to interrupt that last point, given its importance to the work that we do. Robert, please take over. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you, Suzanne. <clears throat> I appreciate that. And thank you, Tim, for setting out the really important element of tort law within this. I'm going to look at the regulation that's happening, and in particular how this is changing uh, the obligations on companies. So uh, if I could have the first slide, please, Paul. What I've got here is just an introduction to the vast scope there is of the types of law that are coming out, primarily across um, the global north, but also within other countries around the world, in which there are various obligations being placed on companies in how they should respond and how what they need to do in relation to human rights, environmental and other social matters. So 
Um, in addition, there's at least a couple of other laws likely to come in the next uh, few months. Uh, there's a referendum in, uh, on the 29th of November in Switzerland as to whether they'll introduce what's called a responsible business initiative. And the German government has indicated it is also likely to introduce legislation. So this is just an existing snapshot of what is happening. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, what I'm showing there is that these legislation are all having different types of uh, approaches to uh, this area of regulation. Some of them are uh, just simply providing a reporting obligation. We're familiar with that with the UK Modern Slavery Act, where the requirement is to report, but there's no monitoring or uh, other expectation. Um, then there's some have a procurement requirement that uh, particularly on um, uh, states, but also on corporations as to uh, what how companies go about uh, procuring. And then some are specifically on the issue of due diligence, which Tim mentioned, uh, and probably those two, the two ones which are most relevant are the uh, French Duty of Vigilance Act and the Dutch uh, Child Labour Due Diligence uh, Act. There are also areas which are related to the issues of human rights and environmental matters, which are in areas such as um, bribery and corruption, where very often there's an intersection between the type of issues which are also in other regulation. And as I say, these aren't solely in the Global North, but there are some others. There's Brazil has a dirty list uh, approach. South Africa has the Black Empowerment Act. There's a range of other um, legislative um, requirements on companies in relation to these areas. And if we could just move to the next slide, please, Paul. Um, I do not intend to go through each of these pieces of legislation, fascinating though it might be, but important though it is, I just want to quickly give an overview of the types of issues which we find in these pieces of legislation. I do that because it's undoubtedly the case that there'll be more and more legislation, including in the UK, um, over the next period of time. And this just sets out some of the types of scope that there is um, and the types of obligations and liabilities under these various forms of, of regulatory uh, aspects. The first point is, well, what human rights are being covered? Interesting, the UN guiding principles, which both Tim and Paul mentioned, make it very clear that human rights issues apply to all companies and all human rights apply to all companies, not just some, not just the ones that companies choose might be of interest to them, but every single one. To give you an example, uh, working with a telecommunications company, they thought the only interest, the only human rights of relevance to them were matters of um, uh, freedom of expression and uh, security over um, people's uh, information. But they neglected the fact that there could be a whole range of human rights issues for when they put cables across land. What are the consequences, say, for the indigenous people involved? What are the communities? So there's a whole range of human rights which companies can inadvertently or otherwise uh, have as a consequence of their actions. So just to give you an example, the French Duty of Visions Act covers all human rights. The proposed Swiss one, only a narrow view, uh, area. And some are on specific human rights. The Modern Slavery Act being an example, um, uh, the, the Dutch uh, the child labour being another example, the US Tariff Act being another example, which only deals in that instance with forced labour. Some of them are beginning to extend it to environmental issues, which certainly wasn't in the initial approach. And I think over time that will include climate change. But also there's which corporations are going to be involved in this. And I think it's quite clear that um, pretty much um, all of them will cover corporate nationals, corporations who are incorporated or domiciled in a particular state, but it might begin to cover, and I think most likely, corporations which are operating within a state. And some have thresholds, uh, say, of number of employees or of turnover. And clearly their aim is supply chain as well. Just one interesting addition, which is the Australian Modern Slavery Act includes public bodies. And also it's interesting, the Australian Modern Slavery Act came out of the learning from the UK Modern Slavery Act, and now the UK Modern Slavery Act is being amended in light of some of the experiences of the Australian Modern Slavery Act. 
Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So what are some of the obligations and uh, liabilities? Well, there's this human rights diligence, which has been already mentioned, but also some are reporting, but there's now a growing element to which the more recent ones include civil claims, criminal claims, and administrative action. And I think that is probably where we're headed. In addition, there's the potential of a defence, uh, which would be enable a company to say, we've done everything reasonable and appropriate, uh, and, and then what has happened is unforeseen. And I think that's quite helpful in terms of understanding that um, there are developments which companies won't always know what, what's uh, going to happen. And I think that's quite important in terms of understanding that um, uh, companies can have a role in how they respond and that simply ticking a box is not good enough. So if we could just look at the next slide, which shows where, where we're headed to really. Um, and this looks at what um, Ray's also going to mention, so I'll just introduce. There's undoubtedly going to be a um, uh, some form of uh, legislation coming from the EU in relation to mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. And these are the potentials. I've just given some idea of where the potential areas might be in, in its coverage. But what's very clear is this legislation will come into being and that it's also probably going to be linked with some legislation on director's duties, which will increase the type of requirements, which um, Tim has already mentioned under Section 172 of the Companies Act and Section 414A uh, to C, which will make obligatory the requirement to take into account other stakeholders' interests, human rights, environment, rather than just to say um, a much less uh, um, normative requirement. Now, I just want to finish with a, a, a last slide, which looks at quite an interesting area, which is, well, why on earth should companies be interested in this at all? Well, I was a co-author of a survey of 631 uh, companies and others asking why on earth would you want this? And what's interesting is there's the very powerful comments. And if you have a look at the business and stakeholders, all of them, more than 60% are saying, we want a level playing field, we want harmonization, we want legal certainty in this area. They don't say, but it's still relevant from what we found, there's also a competitiveness area. Why should a company be competing with, say, a, a company which is using child labor and dropping their costs? Um, and so I think there's a real sense to which more and more companies are wanting this kind of legislation, and that'll influence the whole direction. So I think probably what, what my learning from this is companies need to be alert to these changes in regulation, which are coming at a rapid pace, and they need to ensure that they are not just ticking boxes, but are in reality doing this, or there's a real risk of litigation further down the line. Thanks very much. Terrific, Robert. Thank you so much. Um, Ray, can we hear from you, please? Thank you. I've had some connection problems, so hopefully this will, um, you'll see and hear me. Um, we can. Thank you for those presentations. Um, <laughs> good. Um, and I am going to talk about some of the things that, that Robert has already mentioned in his quick round the world tour on the change in legal landscape. Um, but going back to maybe the 2000s, I suppose the question then was, what do human rights have to do with business? Uh, and then in 2011, um, lots of people saying, well, what do lawyers have to do with implementation of the UN guiding principles? Uh, because they do not create new legal obligations on companies. And on that front, um, just before we get into my actual presentation, just a question back to Rob and Tim, I suppose, which is, um, is the logical extension of the argument you've presented uh, to the Supreme Court in your intervention briefs that actually uh, mandatory human rights due diligence, for example, is already here in the United Kingdom and that we don't need a law? Um, so, looking at the guiding principles, um, they don't create new legal obligations on companies. Uh, they represent a responsibility to respect human rights. I think it was always known from the outset that there, there would be an element of legalization of some of the aspects of the UN guiding principles, not least through implementation by companies within business relationships and translating or trying to cascade all uh, standards um, through their business relationships 
by contracts, for example. And certainly uh, Pillar 1 does contemplate that there will be regulation by states over business activities in appropriate cases to promote the state's duty to protect human rights. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Pillar 2 represents new legally binding obligations on, on companies. Now, what John Ruggie, the author of the Guiding Principles, did say with respect to how Pillar 1 might operate with respect to regulation of companies' um, impacts on human rights was that uh, it's possible that you could create a smart mix of measures to do that, and that the guiding principles aren't a toolbox that can just be lifted off the shop shelf and plugged in. They guide policy and they guide practice. So they don't create a set of corporate obligations. Nor, did, as John Ruggie said, did he ever set out to establish a global enterprise legal liability model, rather a practical way of integrating human rights risk management into enterprise risk managed, management systems. And so, you know, in that context, um, again, how, how would Rob and Tim see their arguments fitting within that framework? So if we could go to my next slide. Um, in terms of regulatory models that have been evolving, as we all know, there was a tendency, the first tool of choice of governments was to impose re reporting requirements, including things like the Modern Slavery Act, which required uh, companies to report on the steps they were taking to prevent certain forms of abuse within their businesses and their supply chains. Uh, and in particular, that's been used in areas of forced labour and trafficking, both in this country and, and in Australia and other parts of the world, including the United States. The fact of reporting was intended to drive further voluntary due diligence in accordance with the guiding principles by virtue of the steps needed to take in order to make reporting meaningful. But there was a sense that it wasn't driving practice in that regard quickly enough um, and not particularly in the areas of the effectiveness in actually dealing with human rights risks uh, at the end of supply chains in particular. This led to the momentum behind the idea that uh, regulation should go beyond reporting and to mandatory human rights due diligence. Now, the real difficulty here is um, what does mandatory human rights due diligence mean? Uh, because obviously within the UN guiding principles construct, there is a four, four aspects to human rights due diligence, the process. Uh, and part, parts of that may or may not be included within a human rights due diligence model. And as John Ruggie has said, what you need to do is tease out by way of policy which parts of what is currently a responsibility to respect is going to actually become some kind of legally binding obligation on companies and, the, and what is the standard to which they'll be held. So in June, the UN, uh, the OHCHR put out an issues paper which basically said there isn't one single model for mandatory human rights due diligence regimes. And on the contrary, when it comes to translating the ideas set out in the UNGPs into a legally binding regime, there are many different variants, meaning that when people are discussing mandatory human rights due diligence regimes, they are potentially discussing a wide range of legal and regulatory possibilities. And in that regard, it's really important when looking at the EU proposed legislation, for example, to look at what the component parts of a regulation dealing with a mandatory due diligence duty uh, comprise and what that might actually mean in terms of increasing obligations on companies and what the legal consequences of that might be. Not least that though, but also considering how you would maximize the, the positive impact of any regulatory measures if the objective is actually to deal with human rights uh, issues within businesses supply chains, overseas supply chains, where it's very difficult to regulate and there may not be adequate processes and legal frameworks on the ground. And that the, reg the regulatory measures, going back to the smart point of, of this, is that they should also mitigate the risks of any unwanted consequences. And those unwanted consequences could either be the exacerbation of human rights impacts because the way in which the, the law works or disincentivizes these companies, um, or unwanted consequences, I think, on, on Businesses, them, businesses themselves and how they'll regulate their behaviors. So if we move on to the next slide, 
Um, as everyone's probably aware, there is a proposal, well, as Rod, Robert mentioned, a proposal uh, for mandatory human rights due diligence in the EU, uh, and legislation is planned to be tabled uh, during the course of next year. There is a consultation that's been commenced by the Commission as to what that due diligence duty may look like and how it would operate, uh, and the consultation is open until February, giving everyone the opportunity to feed into to the process. As Robert also mentioned, it does also tie in with the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative and therefore is very much tied up in with governance reforms within the EU towards sustainable models of business and how directors' duties would operate in that context. So when working towards potentially um, inputting to the, the consultation process, it's important to remember how the two parts of that tie together. Uh, and, and there is a lot of scope, I think, for um, what form the law may take, not least because uh, the Commission's proposal, although it lays forward certain basic you know, proposed definitions and duties, is quite open-ended in terms of inviting responses as to preferred models, and if respondents think that particular approaches won't work, to suggest alternatives. Now, the other thing to, to bear in mind is why might this matter in the UK? It, may not because Robert and Tim may think we're already bound to do this stuff. Um, but which businesses are likely to be covered? And there, it is intended that it won't just be EU incorpor incorporated or domiciled entities, but that non-EU businesses providing goods and services into the EU market would also be covered. Uh, and it remains to be seen how that would operate in practice. Um, a lot of scope also, as I mentioned, as to what the law is likely to require in practice and how the relevant duties and requirements will be defined. And as mentioned, due diligence is a process. The interesting thing about the process, obviously, being that within the UN guiding principles, there is guidance within, for example, guiding principle 19 as to expected approaches to adverse human rights impacts, depending on whether an entity identifies that it's causing or contributing to an impact or whether it's simply directly linked to an impact by its products, goods and services through its business relationships. And it's in that latter context that I think there's going to have to be a lot of care to be taken to, do, to define for businesses um, exactly what the expectations are, how do obligations in relation to due diligence extend beyond the first tier, tier of the supply chain, for example, and how will the expectations within the guiding principles potentially play into those kinds of behaviours. Uh, because the, the direct linkage concept um, has, has, is, a, is a factual link through supply chains that can go on for many tiers. And businesses um, do go to great lengths to uh, cascade expectations through supply chains and undertake various processes that in accordance with it, if done in accordance with guiding principles, take them way above and beyond what is currently required or necessarily expected under existing laws. So the issue there is really, will those expectations be crystallized and hardened into some kind of duty? And if so, what form will it take? Uh, and what would that mean for the for businesses potentially exposures to those affected at some far distant point in the supply chain. Now, it may be that that's not the intention at all, but one aspect of the, um, the Parli Parliamentary Affairs Committee, the European Parliamentary Legal Affairs Committee proposals for a directive in this area does include a proposed amendment to the Brussels regulation to expand jurisdiction in those member state courts to give access to those affected by, um, to give access to, <laughs> against EU domiciled entities where persons are affected by an entity with which the parent, that company has a business relationship. And so in this whole area, I think the, the thing there is the potential for the due diligence scope and the expectations and potential obligations to significantly expand existing legal duties and what that would mean um, particularly since we've seen not just litigation relating to parents for responsibilities in relation to the activities of their subsidiaries, but also efforts to impose liability for entities over acts of independent third parties, obviously in the African Mineral Brothers case in this jurisdiction, and also within supply chains. And then lastly, um, just obviously be interesting to see what these mean for access to remedy. I think I've probably used up my time um, but just to say, I, the common theme with the regulation is obviously um, it's encouraging for business that it's 
it's rooted within um, or, or seeks to promote a UN guiding principles approach because that obviously has affected people at its core. Um, but not. But the important thing, obviously, being to achieve the outcomes in the appropriate ways. And businesses looking at how they can future-proof themselves, given that the EU proposal has one model, uh, it's not necessarily going to create a level playing field or harmonisation. And there are other models which are likely to impact businesses. Um, and that common theme um, is to be encouraged uh, and is a good starting point for prep for preparing to be able to meet any obligations that do come down the road. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much, Ray. I didn't want to cut you off because that was masterful. Um, and if I could have invite the other speakers to please come back. Um, okay. We will attempt to have something of a conversation. We've received a few um, questions through um, the dashboard. Um, I'm going to kick off in order in which you already have spoken um, and start a question for Paul. Um, if you will, you, you ended your remarks with as private entities discharge more and more government functions and acquire greater powers over individuals' lives, we can expect further developments of this kind, of the, the corporate um, issues arising in public law. Would you want to develop that a little bit more and tell us what sort of future developments you foresee in this area? Yes. Um, thank you, Suzanne. Well, I, I mean, I think... I think everything that you've heard, heard today, uh, particularly in Tim and Robert's presentation about the, the impact of uh, wider principles, um, which then inform uh, the development of, of common law principles like, like the law, law of tort. Um, I think what we, we can expect to see as those uh, as the frameworks become, become clearer, judges will use those frameworks to develop underlying principles. But I think what we see in the cases and, and the particular work of Professor Dawn Oliver that I was mentioning is that there's all, always been a strand in English common law uh, of the courts intervening to, to restrain and prevent abuses of power. Uh, and although there's been perhaps a departure uh, of those principles away from uh, public law remedies that one gets through judicial review because of the focus in that context on the nature of the body exercising the power rather than the nature of the power. I do think that we're going to see more public law principles, concepts of rationality, proportionality, fairness, being brought into uh, concepts of in, uh, into contracts, into tort, uh, into uh, those other areas of law which are more obviously private law, but informed by those public law principles uh, of different standards of conduct and behaviour uh, and how discretions are to be exercised. And, and that's what I, uh, I, is my prediction. Mm. Well, do, do any of the other speakers want to pick up on any of those subjects? No. Well, I thought it was a really good segue into posing the question then to Tim and Robert that they know is coming, um, the question that Ray posed already, um, which is essentially, are you suggesting that the UN guiding principles already provide binding obligations on companies that now filter into domestic law in some sense um, with, with your opinion um, in the Vedanta case? Um, or submission in the Vedanta case, I should say. Um, do, Tim, do you want to tackle that question first, and then and then I'll have Robert tackle it. Sure. I mean, I, I think that the answer to that would be in two or three parts. Firstly, um, I would say that the reason we were instructed to intervene again in Okpabi is because because I think it's tolerably clear that they are not binding, at least in the broadest extent and to the fullest extent. Uh, in UK domestic law. What we're seeing, I think, is, is the intersection of two different processes. These, uh, these principles, and, and Ray's absolutely right to say, you know, one can't glibly say the UN GPs and assume that means a single thing in all contexts and, and for all jurisdictions and companies, but, but they're feeding into our domestic law and our domestic practice via two ways. Firstly, uh, by way of the Company Act, and will we see further legislation of this kind uh, coming over the horizon? That's that's a political question. I mean, I think it's fair to say that what we have now is 
is fairly limited. I would be very surprised if it were to be rowed back. It strikes me that in legislative terms, there is kind of one direction. And the question is, is how long that process will take. And it could be a very long process and it could be a very slow process. But 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 we've already seen the kind of harbingers of that, I suppose. Uh, and then the second way that this feeds into our law now is, as I was saying in in, in my short talk, that it, it's feeding into law through the practice of these companies themselves. So they're being held indirectly, I think, to these standards by holding themselves out as meeting the standards. And so you find that feeding its way in. Um, but precisely when or if the UK government would would go considerably further or when the next step might be taken. I mean, maybe Robert's a man who, who lives in this world more than I do and, and, and may have a, a better view on that. But I think that's incredibly difficult to foresee. And I suppose in answer to Ray's question, do, do, you know, do we think that the, the existing domestic legislation gives rise to kind of comprehensive hard-aced obligations uh, of those kinds? No, they do to a limited extent and narrowly. Um, but as I say, I think I, I can't see a world in which in which the direction of travel is anything other than towards that. Um, Robert, I want to. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Robert pick up. I just wanted I wanted to point out. I mean, Ray and I are confronted with the reality of advising clients, and I see this um, question, and it's a bizarre question. But they say, "I'm worried about overcompliance," and you think, yeah. "What does that?" Mean? But what they are thinking is, "Am I anticipating a legal regime that doesn't exist?" And am I going to get myself into more legal risk by following a non-binding set of global standards? Um, and we know what happened in Vedanta uh, by proclaiming adherence to those global standards. If you can't, your actual conduct can't meet your proclaimed um, aspirations. So it, 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 we take your point, but I think it is a risk area. Um, and, and that term over compliance, I find unusual, but is being used by clients. Robert, sorry. <laughs> okay, I, I just, I mean, what Tim said is covered really well. I'll just make two other quick points on that. The first thing is that tort law doesn't cover a lot of human rights, it only covers yeah. some. So any kind of uh, legislation would have to be broader than that. So tort law has only got a limited element. And the second thing is, if there is legislation, it gets over this hurdle for both companies and the victims of these long drawn out cases simply about jurisdiction. You then jump to the merits much more quickly, which I think is possibly in everybody's better interests. And if I can kind of pick up your point by answering one of the questions from, from the audience, which was a great question, is the UK likely to follow this? Well, in fact, just last month, the UK introduced uh, deforestation due diligence um, as part of the environment bill. And that's come out of pressure about dealing with something with climate change. So it's linked. However, we might end up having some legislation on due diligence for deforestation issues and some legislation for due diligence about modern slavery and miss out a whole range of other areas, let's say child labour, which um, really would be problematic for corporate reputation and UK reputation. So piecemeal legislation is not always helpful. And then it comes to your question, what does that mean for compliance? Maybe the way I'll answer that is I happen to be able to sit as a special advisor to the Joint Committee on Human Rights when they had an inquiry on this a couple of years ago. And before us came a number of companies saying, we want this legislation because we're being undercut all the time by those who are not even complying with what is the lowest level, and we want it to be much higher. So I, I see your point about overcompliance. My worry is it's not that's not what's happening. What's really happening is companies are ticking boxes and saying we're doing this. We've done health and safety. We've done envir in, you know, in, environmental issues. We've done employment, but haven't really consulted about it. And so it's not overcompliance. It's actually minimally not complying. It's action without any substance. And I think that is more of a risk than uh, worrying that they are over complying. So I guess I see these developments as likely to lead to it. Whether the UK government chooses to do it or not, of course, you know, maybe the EU does it, the UK government will choose not to, as they think it might be competitive advantage to them. 
What is interesting is that one of my studies showed that actually it's not competitive advantage for companies not to have some clarity in this area. Can I, I have a question from, from the audience, which I'll pose to all of you, and if Ray wants to pick it up, great, um, uh, which is the prospects of a binding instrument um, at the international level that would effectively com um, compel governments or per their agreement to the treaty um, to pass this sort of regulation. Um, what are your thoughts about the prospects of the treaty um, and the effect that it could have on starting to address this sort of patchwork quilt that we have at the moment um, and make it a more coherent uh, uniform standard worldwide? I don't know, Frey, you wanna tackle that? And then I know Robert's been involved, of course, in the treaty. Um, yeah, I mean, Robert's more closely involved. And personally, I just thought that if the EU goes its own way, arguably makes it less likely that there will be a treaty um, because the EU will have, you know, it's got the freedom to act on its own and do it its way. Uh, and that might undermine some of the incentives towards it. On the other hand, I suppose it could equally encourage to have a sort of framework. But I think what it, what it won't do is create any greater certainty necessarily for one of the reasons why I think the, the EU proposal doesn't yet give any form of real certainty as to what businesses should, ex should expect. Um, and there's so many different models of due diligence. So men mentioning you know, the deforestation regulation, it's just about compliance with local laws and sourcing has got nothing, you know, so transposing that into human rights due diligence per the UN GPs um, is, is a whole different thing. I think the, the EU proposal on mandatory human rights due diligence potentially ticks some of the boxes of what the treaty is intended to cover. So there's a degree of, of overlap there. Uh, but again, as I say, because it will be left to member states, uh, members to implement within their domestic laws, there is still the prospect, even if that would happen, which seems unlikely in the immediate future, that it would create a level playing field. Robert. Oh, I would just agree that it's not uh, likely in the near future, but what I think it's done, and, and you hinted this, Ray, is begin to set certain expectations. And I think that is important. Um, it'll set certain expectations on what government should do and how corporations will respond. And I think the interaction between the EU and the treaty will be quite important. It might well work in a different way once the EU sets kind of uh, guidelines, which I think will apply to all companies operating in the EU, it might lead to the treaty beginning to copy a lot of the EU provisions. So I think the treaty is still a long process, but I think it is nevertheless beginning to put expectations on governments as they slowly understand this area and on corporations. I want to um, come back to Paul um, and the subject of public law again. Um, I mean, do you have a, a, a crystal ball as to where these things will start to filter through more, and particularly in, in efforts by the government to, to codify judicial review or to edit other efforts um, to, to bring human rights issues um, into public law? Well, <clears throat> three minutes. Let's see. Um, <laughs> As, as the audience will know, the government are currently consulting on uh, proposals to reform judicial review, um, with the, the central proposal being to codify uh, the principles of judicial review. Um, that would suggest that if they do go down that road, then it would probably shut the door on, on the courts reintroducing the concept of public law principle as they apply to private law in any event through the process of judicial review. Although we probably, as I said, that 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 ship has probably already sailed. Um, so I, I think I think we can we can expect if there is to be any amendments to judicial review there to be restrictions rather than broadening it out um, because this government is particularly concerned about the impact that human rights principles have had on, on the effectiveness of government. That's their perception. Um, so I, I don't think we will see the kind of developments that I've been suggesting might happen necessarily um, uh, through that process. Uh, but then what we are more likely to see, I think, is, is the process that we've already been seeing, which is the courts developing common law principles uh, in other contexts. Uh, that bring in these concepts of rationality, fairness, proportionality, and, and human rights principles. 
Thank you. I do think it's fascinating that we've been seeing um, the issue of, of human rights as well as environment, environmental issues um, penetrating so many different areas of law um, and putting pressure on companies to start to take these into account. Um, and we're particularly seeing it, obviously, in strategic litigation, where we see now judicial review being used, at least in the environmental context, in the climate change context in particular already in this country, but um, more in the human rights context, perhaps on the continent. Um, uh, pressure on governments vis-a-vis -vis the courts um, to, to take into account um, their commitments at the international plane. So it's, it's a really interesting um, area of law. Well, I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, we could go on, I'm afraid, for days on this subject. <clears throat> so it was an awful lot to and try I to pass. I say there were some yeah. great questions on the um, yes. question. Are brilliant and great that people are engaged on this. Sorry. Absolutely. And there, I'm afraid, are many more questions, of course, um, that have come in. Um, and I, I apologize that we certainly couldn't get to them all, but we want to be um, conscientious of everyone's time and stick to the hour. Um, and I want to thank Brick Court Chambers for the invitation and for this wonderful seminar. And thank you to the audience for attending. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Suzanne.